Thank you for joining this core concept lecture on fluorescence in situ hybridization methodology and clinical utility. My name is Lori Ramkasun. I'm the Associate Director of the Cytogenetics Lab here at the University of North Carolina. Today, the objectives of this lecture are to review fish methodology, highlight commonly used fish probe strategies, and illustrate the clinical utility of fish. Fluorescence in situ hybridization is a molecular cytogenetic technique that hybridizes fluorescent probes onto cytological slide preparation. This allows for visualization of target DNA sequences that are of clinical interest. Fish allows for the study of genetic aberrations that are too small to visualize by routine cytogenetic studies and too large to detect using DNA sequencing methods. Fish can be performed on a variety of specimens with only a basic requirement that they have undegraded DNA. Any specimen that can be used for chromosome studies, which evaluate metaphase cells, can also be used for fish studies. These include blood, bone marrow, skin fibroblast, chorionic villi, amniocyte, and solid tumor specimens. Metaphase fish is an important tool for visualizing copy number changes detected by other methods such as microarrays in order to determine the mechanism responsible for the alteration. This helps clarify the clinical significance and determines the recurrence risk for patients and families. Interphase fish can be performed on the same specimens as metaphase fish, but can also be performed on direct preparations, including uncultured cells from the blood, bone marrow, or cytospins, as well as smears made from blood, buccal cells, or bone marrow. Interface fish also offers the opportunity for same-day turnaround time for certain assays, depending on laboratory workflows, and is a critical tool for um, looking at paraffin-embedded tissue sections from tumors or products of conception samples. The basic FISH procedure used in clinical laboratories involves the hybridization of a labeled DNA probe to an in situ chromosomal target. While there's some variation between laboratories, the basic FISH process includes specimen processing and harvesting, slide preparation, denaturing of DNA, reannealing, post-wash steps, and then analysis. The specimen processing and harvesting will depend on the sample type and workflow for any given assay, but typically follows the same steps as those used for cyto conventional cytogenetic analysis. However, unlike G-banded slides, fish slides are not baked at high temperatures for long periods as they will dry out the chromatin and result in poor or no hybridization. Instead, slides can be aged at room temperature soaked in, or soaked in ethanol. Pre-soaking in a salt solution can also help condense and prepare the chromatin. The slides are then dehydrated in various ethanol steps and dried before hybridization. In order for single-stranded DNA to hybridize to the target in, of the DNA in the sample, the DNA must be denatured. Denaturing breaks the hydrogen bonds that hold the complementary DNA strands together. Once these bonds are broken, double-stranded DNA becomes single-stranded DNA. At this point, a single-stranded probe can hybridize to the complementary sequence in the genome. Denaturing is done by heating slides that are in a formamide solution, which is used because formamide lowers the melting point of DNA. The target DNA and probe can be denatured separately and then combined or co-denatured using a hot plate or hybridization device that will denature the two at once. Once the probe and target are denatured, they must now be given time at a specific temperature to reanneal or hybridize to each other. The incubation time to required to reanneal is quite variable and can range from four to 20 hours. The rate at which strands reanneal is dependent upon the DNA concentration, the size of the probe, and the degree of similarity between the probe and the target DNA. After hybridization, the slides are washed to remove unbound or non-specifically bound probe so that the signal is bright and the background is clean. The main variable of these post washes is the stringency of the wash solution. Stringency defines the strictness of the conditions that define how much probe will bind and how much will be washed off. 
the more closely the probe matches the target sequence, the higher the stringency needed to wash it off after hybridization. The stringency can be modified by the temperature and concentration of the form formamide or salt used in the solution. Next, a counter stain is applied, which is a dye that allows concurrent visualization of the probe and chromatin of the, tell, of the cell. The two most common are DAPI and propidium iodide. Cells are then visualized and analyzed under a fluorescence microscope, and cells are scored methodically across this slide, adhering to the guidelines established by each laboratory. Several probe types have been developed in the clinical setting and are valuable for specific purposes. The minimum probe size for fish is around 50 kb, while the largest probes can cover over one megabase. Most probes, however, are usually around two to 400 kilobases. The size of the target will affect how small the probe can be. For example, a highly repeated target will appear bright even with a small sequence. So now we'll cover in more detail the three types of fish, commonly used fish probes. The first type is a whole chromosome paint. These comprise libraries of multiple overlapping chromosome or chromosome region specific probes. They hybridize to unique sequence which cover the length of an entire chromosome or chromosome arm. These probes are useful in studying marker chromosomes, translocations in some instances, and aneuploidy in metaphase cells. As you can see in this image, the whole chromosome paint green and red mark two different chromosomes and is useful to visualize the insertion of material from these two chromosomes on a separate chromosome. Whole chromosome paints, however, are not useful in interface cells. The second type are chromosome enumeration probes. These are satellite DNA or alpha satellite probes that bind to highly repetitive DNA. The satellite DNA is made up of short sequences of highly repetitive DNA that reside in heterochromatic regions of the chromosomes, frequently in the centromere. They can appear as bright as there are generally greater numbers of copies in the target chromatome, which yields an intense signal. These are most often used as control probes and can be useful in detecting aneuploidy. The third is locus specific identifiers, or also known as single copy or unique sequence probes. These can span a specific region and average on size between 200 and 300 KB. They are useful to detect deletions, duplications, in some cases, rearrangements, and amplifications. Locus specific identifiers can also be used in various fusion type probe strategies that we will now review. Locus specific identifiers can be used to design probe strategies like dual fusion probes. These dual fusion probe strategies are used to detect specific translocations by labeling the breakpoints. When the translocation is absent, the two probes show two distinct signals from the two normal homologs of the, involved in the translocation. When a translocation has occurred, this causes the signals to fuse or appear so close together that they produce a yellow fusion signal. With this dual color fusion strategy, both derivative chromosomes can be detected, producing two fusion signals seen in yellow in this rearrangement pattern image of these interface cells. These probes are sensitive in detecting residual disease because the abnormal dual fusion pattern is rarely seen as an artifact of chromosome overlap in interface cells. The strategy is typically designed to facilitate diagnosis of recurring translocations and provide a useful tool for disease monitoring. Break apart probe strategies, on the other hand, are used for detection of specific translocations in interphase. They are particularly useful for detecting translocations of promiscuous genes that can partner with several different genes. The two probe signals in this case are normally positioned at two adjacent positions on the same chromosome, flanking the gene of interest. In a normal cell, the two signals emit one fusion color. When a separation or a rearrangement is observed, distinct red and green cells will be seen in place of a yellow fusion signal. The advantage of this strategy is that metaphase cells are not required 
to detect the presence of a rearrangement. So ab a small number of abnormal cells can be detected and they're especially useful in FFPE samples. When the translocation partner is needed to be identified, this can be done by viewing a metaphase cell on the same fish slide or by performing a sequential fish assay on a cell that has previously been G-banded, where we can see the normal homolog with the fusion signal and then determine which chromosome has received one of the ends of the gene of interest. FISH is used in a variety of important clinical contexts, including interpreting abnormal karyotypes from both constitutional and cancer cases, detecting diagnostic abnormalities, providing prognostic information for some cancer types, and abnormal FISH patterns may also serve as a monitor of disease or response to therapy. Here's an example of clinical utility of, of FISH that we commonly see in the cytogenetics lab. A patient will present with unusual bruising on legs and arms, as well as gum bleeding, and her complete blood, the complete blood count may show pancytopenia. Rare blasts can also be present in the peripheral blood. In these cases, a request is sent to the cytogenetics lab to rule out acute promyelocytic leukemia, or APL. APL counts for 5 to 20 percent of cases of acute myeloid leukemia, and represents a medical emergency with a high rate of early mortality. It is critical to diagnose this disease and start treatment with a differentiation agent such as all transretinoic acid. AML of this subtype is defined by the presence of a reciprocal translocation between the long arms of chromosomes 15 and 17, which creates a fusion gene pml ra, -ra. FISH is especially useful as it can be performed as a rapid assay on suspected samples. Although this translocation is visible by conventional G-band analysis, FISH is less expensive and quicker than conventional cytogenetics to detect this. This can usually be performed within 24 hours and in some instances, an even shorter period of time. For this assay, labs typically employ two strategies, the pml ra, -RA dual fusion assay to detect the 1517 with a dual fusion pattern in abnormal cells. But because there are variant RA-RA rearrangements that can also respond to differentiations that do not involve PML, an additional RA-RA break-apart strategy is also employed in order to detect these rare RA-RA rearrangements. So to summarize, FISH is a molecular cytogenetic technique that allows visualization of target sequences that are of clinical interest. FISH assays use various combination of whole chromosome paints, chromosome enumeration probes, or locus-specific identifiers. FISH offers a fast and effective diagnostic and prognostic tool in various clinical settings. Thank you for your time.